go five four three two one hello and welcome to the february 2023 coffee break with pure storage like it says there vmware and pure we've done so much together but we're not done yet there's still a lot more coming there i even had someone who was saying like did you did you mean a monty python monty python reference in there actually i didn't but hey I'll, I'll take it for free too that's sometimes what happens when you have fun with titles there's other ones that come in but it's more just a reflection of that history that heritage and how we continue to collaborate and do more stuff together a little bit of housekeeping to start off but i am really excited to be joined today by david stamen david thanks so much for uh thanks so much for being in the boat with me here today for the next 45 minutes or so oh no i really appreciate it i've i've, I've been like i think i've been hounding you for a while now i'm like where's my time to be able to get on <laughs> it and talk to everybody and I think we're finally there and it's good there's been so much great content and i'm glad to kind of talk about everything that we're doing um and continuing to do so a little bit of housekeeping thank you as always this is a series and thanks to the graphic design team just they, they keep doing fun stuff with you know whether it's the cups or the branding etc if you want to find previous ones because thanks to the solution focus these have aged better i believe than sometimes other other approaches so you can go back and look here these are now as well on the purestorage.com slash events page, you can go there to both to find coffee breaks, but all of the different webinars that we run with different focuses. If you wanna find previous ones, you can click down there and look at previously aired events. If you find this interesting, you like the format, you like the guests, go back and listen to previous topics kind of thing. As well, first month to talk about this, our yearly conference is coming at Resorts World Las Vegas from June 14th to 16th, Pure Accelerate 2023. Would love to see some of you there. And I, I'm guessing I should wear cool sunglasses when I'm there. I'm not sure. That just feels right, given the image. And as always, there is uh, there are coffee cards involved, as we talked about last month. The first 1,000 participants to register and attend will receive a $10 card. We will do a drawing at the end for a Copper Edition Ember 10-ounce mug. The one David was just, just showing. That's so, that's so amazing. You've got the good background. You've got the mug. Like you're, This is already winning kind of thing. Uh, of course, there are some folks here where um, we can't send those to you. Hopefully, you know and understand that. But we really appreciate you joining that because especially even on the partner front and pure storage employees really love having you on as well. For introductions, for myself, I'm your host, Andrew Miller. I'm not going to introduce myself because uh, I'm, I'm here every month. But in this case, for this topic, we think about VMware and Pure. I even go back to my early days with VMware and thinking about playing with VI 2.0. Well, it wasn't even VI. It was two, ESX 2.5 waiting for VI3 so I could have DRS and HA as I was taking my group-wise server budget for an upgrade to buy a storage array. It wasn't a pure one, but pure didn't exist back then. And then actually buy a bunch of 1U rack around servers, they were IBM at the time, and launch into uh, the land of the service console. And you did NTP configs manual and all this stuff, and then following it along with VCP 3, 4, 5, 6. So I, I, I don't pretend that I focus on VMware in some ways like I used to, but man, there's all that history there. And it's still, frankly, I still remember the first time I saw vMotion. I think for a lot of us, we remember that because it was so cool. David, you mind giving a brief background on yourself? Yeah, so here at Pure, um, as we everybody noticed, we, I guess we didn't even announce it, but we got promoted. So um, I'm also now our global practice leader for platform. So I cover all of our virtualization and cloud solutions and kind of act as the way to lead this in the field globally, both internally and externally. So really happy to kind of partner with the entire ecosystem and see what we can do here at Pure to assess with collateral new initiatives and kind of all of those transformation projects. I'm not going to get super deep into the history because we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But as far as my background goes, um, employee, partner, um, customer, um, healthcare, MSP, kind of been all through that. Um, and again, you can always find me on Twitter, um, GitHub and blogs. Um, and I'm also a VMware V-Expert, a VMware Code Coach. Um, and my background of stuff is, is pretty, pretty wide. So I, I kind of like that is, well, I haven't been doing VMware as long as Andrew. Um, I've been really diving super deep into it um, since I've been involved, and I've been able to kind of understand everything inside and out there. I mean, this is now a long history for many of us. And Frank, thanks for the, the compliments, folks. For the David, congratulations to you as Global Practice Leader of Platforms. I'm in a lead principal technologist, America's role. We can talk about that later. It's not the focus, but you know, still enjoying being here at Pure and seeing continuing progression and growth of the company, and have enjoyed participating in and driving that. Next month, we will have another coffee break. What a surprise, AIN ML Beyond the Buzzwords into Reality with Pure One. 
actually we end up inviting Sandeep from our product management team, partly because he's in product management around doing this stuff at Pure, but also because of his history in this space. And so it's going to be a little bit of a walk through through that both that topic at an overall level. And so what he's seen outside of Pure and then what he's doing inside Pure. And if there's anything that's buzzword worthy right now, I think it would be AI and ML for the title. But into our time. So as always, we've got a little bit of a lightweight agenda, uh, not too heavy. So like it says, you know, we're not done yet. That's a little bit of a nod to we've been doing stuff together for so long. And there's so much depth there and there's more coming. I wanted to frankly start with going a little bit deeper into, into your background, David, uh, was, you know, but was in calling out some career lessons along the way. We periodically do that with guests that we have on because uh, we're, we're all human, right? We're navigating this landscape of ever-changing landscape of IT. Then jumping in a little in the time machine looking at what pure has done historically with vmware even what vvols is and some adoption phases there this is frankly meant to be more educational and here's all the pure stuff it's it's looking back in history then specifically new cool things with pure and vmware and last but not least a little bit of a look forward you know what's coming even even more goodness hopefully this feels fair as always we'll keep it moving you know back and forth and please please don't hesitate to put questions into the q a or even just commentary into the chat Really appreciate both uh, Jason Langer and Tristan Todd joining us today. The help with that, you can find them as well on Twitter. They're super deep on these topics as well. I've enjoyed working with them over the years and talked about partner backs background and time at VMware and etc. So, before we dive in, though, uh, Lauren, do you mind launching the first poll? And we'll see this pop up here in just a second. So. A little bit of maybe a, a palate cleanser, but even looking back, just curious, what version of vSphere did you start with? And, and maybe for some of you, it's like, eh, I'm here for the coffee card. I'm here because I've heard the word VMware. So, you know, that's a solid run at 10%. I'm just going to leave this open uh, so yeah, everyone has time to participate. And we'll dive in. So, David, looking back at your career, do you mind kind of just starting out with, with a little bit of a kind of a narration? I think it even started for you with Comp USA and, and Help Desk. And then I was thinking of how I started in the Help Desk. You mind starting from there and just kind of wander yeah. through briefly? Yeah, my journey's kind of been one of those things. Like I've always said, and I know we're gonna get into this, that I'm always trying to figure out what I wanna do when I grow. And it, it's literally been this way from the very beginning is I love computers, I love technology. I got like my first one when I was 13. And so like one of the first things when I worked is I worked at Comp USA and I was like the customer service manager. Everybody returned stuff and I hated that. So I moved to like the sales and I had this customer that came in all the time with their families. It was pretty much worked. Like I sold them cell phones every single year because they were free. And I pretty much built this really cool relationship. And then ultimately CompUSA went out of business and everybody was scrambling to find new jobs. And I had kind of found one, but they reached out and says, if you ever need anything, reach out to me and I'll make sure to, to help you out. So I kind of worked in a, in a healthcare industry here and worked at their help desk and really kind of started this journey of what I call IT. Um, I was there in healthcare for about eight years, starting from help desk to executive to VIP support, becoming a network admin and infrastructure admin, a solution architect. And I think that really goes to like my whole background is I learned everything from what the end users are doing and kind of translating that all the way to a solution design. And then over that time, I went to work for a partner doing managed services. So even opened up that knowledge across really a whole lot of different verticals. Um, I kind of got to the point where I'm like, I really want to be able to focus on hands-on and went back to the customer side, focusing on bringing up and kind of modernizing a lot of the platform stuff there. And then I had the, the best chance to work at VMware where I did tech marketing, traveling all over the world, talking to customers about virtualization and all of these things. And so really from that, um, unfortunately the best worst thing that ever happened, which is the perfect <laughs> thing to really talk about in this day and age, is in January of 21, I think it was, or 2020, I was rift. And I thought, what am I gonna do? I was laid off, it's never happened to me before. And a couple of folks at Pure reached out and says, we have this awesome position for you. And I've been here since then, it's been three years, um, I think next Monday, and I literally have loved it here. So as much as I hated it, it's honestly the best thing that's ever happened to me. So I, I know we're gonna kind of talk about that, but layoffs are really big now. And I just want to say, like, don't give up. It, it, it could always be a blessing in disguise. So let me, let me pull a couple of those themes there. because And this is the goal. You know, we all, we all have histories. And, and what can we extract out that's, frankly, hopeful, hopefully useful for folks listening. So the first one you mentioned is that, you know, I still figure out what I want to be when I grow up. When you said that earlier when we were preparing, I was like, 
I use that line too. I, I think I've used it longer than I've known you and you've known me, but it's just like this idea of staying curious. Look, not It's not being like we're looking at jobs as stepping stones kind of thing, but we are thinking about what's next. I'm not just here to do the thing, but I'm actually here to learn and build and create more. Sometimes that's even, even can be, I'm not here to click all the buttons. I'm here to automate the things, right? You know, that can be part of what's next in that. So there's all these ways of that, that staying curious goes. And, and back to you before I keep going with a, a couple other themes, so. Yeah, no, it's definitely interesting. So the, really excited about that. The other piece there, and this is maybe two together, is um, you mentioned a little bit, but I just want to have you pull out a little further, if you don't mind, just in community involvement and what that's meant for you. And I think even there, you mentioned there was a little bit of you weren't quite sure and you got thrown in the deep end and it worked out. But do you mind kind of playing through that a little bit from a community standpoint? Yeah, so kind of the really cool thing about my my early on in that first role um, when I was at sysadmin, I had a, a really good mentor at the time. And it's really something that has really pushed me to kind of make mentorship a big part of the career. And I was always heavily involved involved with VMUG. It's been around forever. And obviously we know they there's been a lot of um, challenges there and we're definitely seeing that community grow again. But we had a leader and they said, I'm going to work for a partner and for VMware. I can't become a leader. Um, are you, do you want to do it? I'm like, well, I kind Maybe. of want to, I kind of don't, <laughs> I, I don't like public speaking. And it was pretty much like, I know you can do it. Here you go. Um, and honestly, like at that point, I hated public speaking. I couldn't do anything, but that was really, I would say a really good launch point into everything else career-wise because being in there opens me up to becoming a VMUG leader and embracing a whole new community. From there, it allowed me to branch into like the, the land of being a V expert and working with other VMware influencers, even though influencer wasn't a thing back then, but mm -hmm. understanding how we do and how we network and building this because we always say it's not what you know it's who you know a little bit and there's always something you can learn so i kind of feel like from there i got to branch off and present at vm world so it's always kind of this really big launching point that now what do i do i talk to 1700 people on a zoom when i was scared to talk to like two people in a room at, at one point i think it's really matured over the past i don't even know how many years it's been anymore so you're doing great Last last ones I think I'll pull here because we so much to go through. Good stuff. But is this idea, and it's actually kind of pairing two up. Um, the the idea of sometimes I think about confidence without arrogance, and I'm I'm going to quote you from from what we talked about before about it's not what you know, but how you can communicate it with confidence, which which isn't the same as yeah. arrogance. It's a confidence. Yeah. You want to just kind of continue on that a little bit? Um trying to figure out the best way to kind of tackle that, right, is the idea here is not everybody knows everything. Um, mm -hmm. And it's part of those things, like when even when you think in an interview, if you don't know the question, someone's going to know if you're lying. And sometimes it's better is I'm going to follow up in regard to that. Mm -hmm. And so in some cases, as long as you can express confidence in what you're talking about, it can provide that. And especially in our world where we're interfacing with many different customers, organizations large. And theoretically, one of my challenges in previous roles, even this one, is what happens if someone comes into a room that might know more about a specific technology than you are? Could happen. There's always going to be someone that knows more. But if you can relay kind of the requirements and the strategy and the solutions and kind of all of these things, it really allows them to embrace confidence in you. And as we're leaders and kind of handling this, they need to make sure that who they're talking to is someone that they can trust and become a, a value partner in the organization. The phrase I think of there sometimes is knowing what you don't know. I think of this for myself too. And then being being comfortable with that and, and a, a degree of humility in that. Hopefully you're there because we know a lot of stuff, but we don't we don't know everything. Final piece there is, um, it's just kind of a comment as a time back to the community. I, I love, David, the comment about, you know, best worst thing that ever happened to me. I, I think John, Jonathan commented in the chat about, I love seeing yourself and Jace McCarty come over here. And this is where, from a community standpoint, I mean, there is pay it forward stuff. We don't know exactly how it's going to work out, but it was, it was those community relationships that ended up help, helping you land at Pure, even through what wasn't the most fun way to get here in a way. And we're glad you're here. So, no, I appreciate that. Okay, section number two, and actually, I will go ahead. I think here, and I'll I'll just go ahead and close the poll because we had a whole bunch of people respond, and then we'll dive into the time machine, and let me share the results back out here. So hopefully everyone can see this. What version of vSphere did you start with? Uh, so we this is actually a pretty solid spread. 
only four percent saying uh, what's VMware. So hopefully, um, I, I I hope you enjoy the time here because we're not going to do a lot of VMware basics here. We'll do some Vivol basics, uh, Vivol kind of one hundred one stuff. But uh, we're pretty evenly spread between kind of the three categories, and then a bunch of folks that aren't VMware admins and are just here to learn. So very cool, very cool. So time machine time. <clears throat> we thought about this a little bit, how to approach this, because there's so much that Pure has done historically with VMware. And any given item that we might do, we do, might be new to you because you haven't looked at it kind of thing. So one, I want to acknowledge that uh, about oh, a year and a half ago now, roughly, I uh, had Cody Hosterman on. What we talked about there, you know, ain't nobody got time for managing storage, a history of simplifying VMware storage is still relevant. I, I didn't go back and listen to the recording, but I don't think anything in there is stuff that doesn't apply anymore. And especially some of Cody's history and background is really cool to hear. But we want to do a brief review of some of the general things that Pure has done for a long time. And some of these you may not know. So I think, David, do you mind kind of taking us through the core of, in this case, really Flash Array, but even Pure for VMware workloads and, and what stands out to you? Yeah, and I kind of really like this. As I mentioned, part of my history was I was a pure customer. And the best thing that kind of showcases the ideal storage platform is just simplicity and extensibility. Um, this was probably like six, eight years ago is we had our SE drop off our array and said, I'm going to lunch. When we get back, we'll configure it. <laughs> and 15 minutes later, I replied, it's already up and running. I'm, I'm already running workloads on it. It, it is truly simple. And a lot of that comes down to a lot of things we're going to talk about. It's when we think about uptime, right? We don't have to worry about trading off, balancing stuff between storage controllers and balancing it there. It's all done automatically. We don't even have to worry about that. We can withstand that performance through both failures and maintenance. And again, through that uptime, failures rarely happen. But what's important is all of our features are just enabled by default on the array or the options are kind of hidden that you don't need to think about that. So think about global data reduction, thin provisioning, deduplication compression. Those are things that are always on. And so when we create volumes, all you have to do is give it a name and give it a capacity. There's no other knobs to turn. There's things that you can set such as like protection for replication and snapshots, but it's there by default. You don't have to worry about those. And the best thing is, is you don't have to worry about maintaining hours of managing software updates. It's all delivered directly through the cloud, through our support organization. And we're even driving that one step further through our cloud delivered updates. But as we think about this from a VMware perspective, what does it really mean? Um, we are a technical partner with VMware, which means we're always doing joint development, which means everything we try to do, we try to provide native and by default in the hypervisor. We have a best practices guide but it's more of a best practice recommendations. Why did we choose these settings and what happens if you were to change them? So our multipathing is default in the hypervisor. Our SATP policies are default within the hypervisor. We work with VASA for our VVOLs and all of these services. And so it's kind of an important thing is that when you set up our array, there's really no best practices to set. It's just there by default. The last thing that I kind of want to focus on is performance, because that's always a big thing when we think about having storage for these environments. And sometimes when we think about best practices, customers ask me, what is your best practice for a volume size? Like we're using two terabytes today. And ultimately it comes down to it's whatever you want. It's a business level decision. Mm -hmm. From a flash rate perspective, whether it's one terabyte or 64 terabytes, performance is exactly the same. We tend to see customers carve it up based off business requirements. This one needs to be snapshotted. This one needs to be replicated. And we'll really dive into, from a VMFS perspective, how do VVOLs actually change that? And so it really is this ideal scenario, right? Flash Array X is our latency optimized. Flash Array C is our capacity optimized, but still very performant. There's a lot of integrations there though, because VMware has, it's more than just what's here, right? There's a good, there's kind yeah. of a big portfolio there. This is a really big portfolio. So I'll kind of build that out here for a second, right? So if you really think about VMware as a whole, it's really drastically matured. When we used to think about VMware and even VMUGs and these user cons, it was what does vCenter and vSphere do? But over time, we brought in vVols and VMware Cloud Foundation and Cloud Director, and now there's Tanzoom, there's Horizon, and now the whole ARIA suite of stuff, right? If you haven't realized that they got rid of um, it's no longer, um, it's now not v -realized Realize. Operations or, Pour one out for v -realize. It was VCOP, v Realize, now it's ARIA. Um, and so really what it comes down to is it's not just coordinating at the storage layer, but it's also putting out all of these things and making sure that we have this full ecosystem. 
And again, as a technology partner with VMware, we have the ability to develop and kind of drive a lot of innovation with these solutions to make sure that we're collaborating well and continuing to drive what we do very well. And what's also important is flash array is a block storage array. While we do have some file protocols, they're not there for VMware yet. But what's important to understand is whether it's fiber channel, iSCSI, right? We can maintain all of that really good at leveraging existing investments. With VVOLs, we can also adopt those off of those things. And then as we see a lot of innovations and in technology drive, especially around NVMe over fabrics, we're also going to be seeing a lot of options change there. So with the latest version of Purity, we now support NVMe over fabrics with TCP. Um, and our great solutions team just put out a bunch of content. So thanks to Nelson for that. We can always link that after the fact. But a lot of customers are looking to adopt that because you don't need really any specialized hardware, right? You can use your the off-the-shelf HBAs. But where this is important is the reason why it took, I wouldn't say it took us a little bit longer to do that, was that even from a VMware perspective, it wasn't there. If you think about in vSphere 7, there was NVMe over fabrics, but it was no VAI, no clustering, no shared disk. It was pretty much a raw performance volume, which met some requirements, but not a lot of them. And so now it's kind of the right time for the right protocol as we kind of think about this. And then when we kind of think about um, the overall strategy of what we're doing from a protection. I always like to say is while we have the right protocol for the right job, we also have the right form of data protection for that. So whether it's the most basic of doing local snapshots on an array for ransomware and, and availability, we have the ability to do that. When we think about how can we globally protect our data, and again, whether it's through anything, we have the ability to do our replication, whether it's synchronous, whether it's asynchronous, whether it's periodic, whether it's continuous, but really tied in in a very efficient manner to have customers provide these low RPOs and low RTOs, whether that's between their private cloud, whether it's between their, their public cloud, um, or even their hybrid cloud, or whether it's something sitting in a, in a colo or an MSP like the tier points or the Equinix metals of the world. And even the ability to tie those in with all of our backup partners through our integrations to make all of those backup utilities operate even more. And then taking that one step further to bridge that to the public cloud, whether it's AWS or Azure, or even our cloud snap functionality. Mm -hmm. But the best part about this is a unified visibility through Pier 1. So it's kind of really one of those really great things that when we think about modern data protection, there's many different ways. And it's always the big kind of question is, is it business continuity or disaster recovery? And I feel like our whole MDP um, is all about kind of encompassing all of that together and delivering that to our, our customer base. So last Any, question before I kind of, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 I was going to just make a comment about ESX top, but I feel like I jumped the gun on you. So keep going. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was clicking on the wrong slide, but that's why it didn't happen. Yeah. I can make it. Uh, so, so anyone who spent time staring at ESX top with all the different things you look at and your head hurts, hey, we got something for you. Yeah, so virtual machine analytics, and I'm probably going to uh, get in trouble for saying this, as I always like saying it, is VM analytics is probably one of the best free value add tools that you have as a pure customer, but you theoretically don't need to be a pure customer. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of follow up with that, what this actually is. So virtual machine analytics is essentially the way that we can correlate physical to virtual data from your VMware environment to your storage. So if we think about this, this is kind of a cutoff screenshot a little bit, but we show the disk to the VM, to the host, to the data store, to the volume, to the array. And as an admin, you always know that someone comes to you and says, my VM is slow. Um, and then it's normally the storage team pointing fingers at the infrastructure team, pointing fingers at the network team, and then the security team. And nobody really knows what is actually happening. And so with VM analytics, you can actually search for your VM that's experiencing an issue and see the breakdown of latency or performance at each individual layer. And so if the VM is showing high latency, but the host isn't and the volume isn't and that right there, it really shows that there's an issue at the VM level. And so the infrastructure teams aren't scrambling. It's saying, hey, this is a, an application-driven workflow that needs to be engaged. If we're seeing latency somewhere more upstream, then that kind of shows that target. So it really depicts all of this. The really cool part about this is while the volume and array information gets phoned home directly from our pure arrays, we also will collect the data store down metrics through vCenter. So if you're using vVols or RDMs or NFS or any other third-party storage, we'll still show that correlation of this first part. Um, so Tristan just posted a link to all of this as well. So it's really a, a great way to troubleshoot. 
it is only seven days of historical data built in, but a lot of this can still be mapped into the ARIA operations management pack that we kind of talked about earlier. It's meant for real-time troubleshooting. I sometimes describe this as someone who walks in your office and fastest path to, not my fault, talk to somebody else, or mm, can you come back later while I look at something? That kind of thing. Real-time troubleshooting and with some history. Thank you. Lauren, do you mind pulling up poll number two? We're going to go into a little bit of a VVOL overview. And uh, man, time always goes fast. It's crazy. So uh, poll number two, are you using VVOLs today? And the reason we're going to do this first is Literally, David next is going to give a bit of a VVOL technical overview, and then I'll give a little bit of, frankly, kind of adoption history. So I'm not even going to read this poll at you because it's relatively easy to read. Are you using VVOLs today? Go look at the questions, uh, the, the answers. David, do you mind continuing with just kind of walking us through basically where VVOLs came from and why it got created and what it does? And this is, to be real, this is pure, purely, <laughs> no bad puns intended, education for folks out there about VVOL. So please, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll definitely cover that. And I saw that Craig does, did ask a question to the host and panelists. Please make sure you actually put those in the Q&A so they can be tracked and documented and shared. And we'll, we'll love to connect with you for a bunch of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so really this whole concept of VVOL, this is we think about this kind of, this quote, I kind of like it, is with VMFS, you're provisioning storage for infrastructure instead of the applications. And this is really one of those key things, especially when we talked about provisioning storage and data store sizes and kind of all of these items. Because the way storage was essentially originally designed, and if we, we can even take this to a container land is how we can help optimize that, but that's for another day. It's when you have a ESXi host, um, you map storage to that individual host and that one host uh, runs multiple VMs. But in the end, that single singular data store is a single container for all of your storage, which means if you have many different VMs, many different disks, there is gonna be kind of that mapping of all of that visibility, all of those data services are really locked down to that bottom. And so it's very tedious and kind of hard to manage because if you wanna be able to assign capacity, you have to grow that entire data store. If you wanna manage performance, it's that of that data store. And again, for us, it's not really an issue, but it really comes down to array services. If you want that data store, say you want like that volume one to be snapshotted. Well, you have to say the entire volume of a VMFS perspective needs to be snapshotted, which means you might be protecting more data than what you want. If you think about this in an SRM world, we go ahead and think about, you might need a whole bunch of protection groups and a whole bunch of data stores, and there's a lot of sprawl. So when we think about how VMFS kind of works, right? It's, it's still that many volume to that host mapping, but it's still difficult to troubleshoot these issues is find out where is everything defined. VM analytics can help with this a little bit because we have that mapping from a capacity level and performance level, but it's still not truly visibility. The VMs don't have access to those data services. And so this is really where we see the benefits and I'll kind of build this out here of where VVOLs really help. Um, when we think about a VMFS data store with a LUN, the data services are at the LUN level, which means you have all of these workloads with the exact same SLA. If you have a noisy neighbor, well, that one VM or that one volume can impact everything on that entire data store. But as we're trying to track growth, uh, what happens from a performance and capacity? It's at that LUN level, it's not there. But what's also important is this compliance drift of when we actually look at a volume and you apply a policy to a VMFS data store, that's done at the storage level. And so if your storage admin changes that policy, you really don't know that it happened at the vSphere level. With VVOLs and the integrated storage policy management, that becomes front and center and provides you a lot of that flexibility. And so when we kind of think about where VVOLs come in, right, is think about VVOLs as an integrated RDM. And we kind of think about RDMs as a bad word, but it's not bad in the sense, it's a raw device mapping. It's a goal. It's an integrated, yeah, it's a goal. <laughs> It's an integrated management framework that allows you to virtualize your arrays to be able to enable a more efficient, optimized, centered application. And that's kind of VMware's definition. And we'll kind of showcase what does that actually mean. So these here, virtual volumes, right? Um, simplified storage management operates control shooting because it's not managing storage anymore. You're managing your data at the VM level. It becomes granular storage, that's both policy-based managed, and all of the data services are still accessible and offloaded to the array. We're not going to go super deep into everything VVOLs because that would just be a, a much yeah. longer story. Uh, <laughs> we've done really deep with deep webinar or webinars on this with our team. So we can always link and follow up with those. 
But when we think about what is a virtual volume, we're gonna cover this at a high level. A VVOL again is a well-orchestrated system of a raw device mapping, not an RDF. Why these are beneficial is because there's no file system on the underlying disks, no VMFS and NFS, which means it provides a whole lot of flexibility as we're having to migrate workloads around and this whole data mobility platform. We don't have to worry about if we take that VM and migrate it from VMware to Hyper-V or from Hyper-V to KVM or from this to that or to the cloud. Um, it truly becomes the guest OS is the native file system. And you don't pre-provision anything, right? You say, I want a disk with 20 terabytes. It provisions that disk and maps it to the VM. It's integrated. And storage policy-based management is you say, I want it to be snapshotted or I want it to be replicated. And the arrays policies are exposed and allow that. And then the replication management and unmap, a whole lot of benefits here. Um, I'll kind of talk about this and, and kind of see if there's any other thoughts on this, Andrew. But the reason why pass-through unmap on VVOLs is very important is when we even think about performance and deploying. Um, traditionally, when you use VMFS, you have to think about thin or thick provisioned VMDKs, right? It's a, it's a complicated question, even though it's two choices. We always say, if you want performance, go thick. If you want capacity efficiencies, go thin. But if you want the best of both worlds, there wasn't really an option until now. Mm -hmm. VVOLs are raw disk, so you get all of the performance, but it's a thin provision disk, so you get all the capacity efficiencies. So things like database servers that might have a high churn of rate and you want to do in-guest on map, VVOLs are really great candidates for some of those. I think if you don't mind, David, I'll, I'll wrap up this section and uh, jump into adoption history. There's there's so much good stuff here we could even go into, like it shows there about testing without replacing, coexistence. It's very easy. It can be easy to move into them. And then like you were saying, it lets it be policy driven, application centric, et cetera. I know I'm almost accelerating this a little bit, so I wanna make sure I don't keep you from putting in any other key items you wanna mention here. No, that, that's kind of important. This kind of just showcases that whole infrastructure centric approach to, to application centric approach. Yes, yes. So if you've been in this space for a little while, you've heard about VVOLs for a long time. I think my first preview into them was maybe 10 years ago. I might be making that up. Someone can go look on Google and play Stump the Chump and be like, hey, you know, so one thing that we've realized, and actually we first did some of this when you and I did were presenting at Tech Field Day uh, at VMware Explore. So some of this you may have seen before, but you know, some things don't change. It's still, especially the yeah. history. So often when we look at technology, uh, we have the idea of an adoption curve, okay? You know, so you've got tech enthusiasts, visionaries, primaries, et cetera. And, you know, there's this idea of, like, you know, eventually you get to uh, early adopters and you get to mainstream then late adopters, et cetera. What we saw with VVOLs, interestingly enough, was early in, there were some bumps along the way. And we're going to hit on some of the challenges that we've seen and that we've engineered for really well later. But there was almost like there was this Gen 1 of VVOL adoption. And then there was almost like a reset because there were some challenges with VASA provider and stability and some other pieces. You know, this is going back 10 years ago, like all these great goals, the core principles and ideas that you were talking about have been the same, but some of the underlying implementation and the capabilities even at the time storage wise wasn't robust enough to handle it. So it was almost more like we had kind of Gen 1 VVOL adoption. And then it was more of like, okay, let's reset and almost kind of start over. And, and the reason that I bring that up is because sometimes we'll have folks who have looked at VVOLs a long time ago and been like, eh, it didn't work for me. I just want to highlight there's a new set of capabilities and almost a redefinition of VVOL implementation there. But what we saw then was that as we built this out, originally VVOL is a standard that if you didn't just uh, apply comply specifically with the way it was designed, um, if you and you went colored outside the box a little bit, you'd actually have problems. So we saw and saw, you know, that there was a standard and it wasn't both flexibility and stability. We're almost kind of going against each other this way. I know I'm being a little bit high level industry. So, you know, the analogy is that we had, you know, Gen 1 and Gen 2 VVOLs. If anyone remembers this from like as a kid, you know, you put this together, we got it and you glued it together and then it was done. It wasn't changing, you know, kind of thing. And if you broke something off, well, that's sad. So the goal is, as we've been working on this, is that we want to get from Gen 1 and 2 VVOLs by a lot of work, a huge amount of work around scale, performance at scale, because that's a different thing, and stability at scale. So this is performance of VASA, of managed snapshots, et cetera. 
to get to something that's more like this. Maybe call it a Gen 2.5 V-Vols. Actually, in my, when we presented this, my, my boss, Jenny Wallace, was kind enough to send this to me. I've actually sadly not finished this, and I need to. But where it's you know way more flexible, yeah, we're still putting the thing together, and that we want to continue to be the best VVOL and VMware storage platform because, according to VMware, Pure is actually the most deployed platform for virtual volumes, amazingly, right? Let's go ahead and, uh, Lauren, actually, I'll, I'll do it here. I will close up the first poll, second poll, and share that back. Uh, David, this is just interesting. You know, we're seeing are using VVOLs today, 17%, uh, yes, for the majority. Uh, specific uses, so we're almost at a halfway-ish point of people using it, and then there's a mix of people that aren't. Uh, if you don't mind, Lauren, go ahead and uh, sharing the third poll. That would be great, and we will uh, dive into our final sections here today. So if you're it not, should be polls, kind of, <laughs> yeah. it should be interesting. <laughs> I was expecting that to be a little bit more of a an, an imbalance ratio as we kind of thought about this question. And there's a lot of stuff here, and I, I know there's a lot of this questions of, I know the probably the people that said they're not using it or the RDMs for life are probably kind of following into this. I need active DR and active cluster support. We hear you. Um, it's not an us thing. Um, we're working very closely with VMware to deliver those solutions. Um, so stay tuned. Um, always consult your peer account team or your VMware reps mm -hmm. to kind of give you any updates in regards to that as well. So let's talk about what's new and cool. Uh, specific or, or uh, right, yeah, the new coolness. That's what I'm supposed to say. That's the yes. title. So there's some pieces here around vSphere. There's some pieces here around vVols, and then you mean a little bit of philosophical, you know, APIs versus file systems. So do you mind taking us through some of the what's new? Yeah, and this is kind of showcases that we're not done yet, right? There's this whole ever not evergreen, but this whole development of continuing to mature it. Like our vSphere plugin is really kind of that that first point of extensibility. It's bringing in all of these features that you don't need to manage storage. Just sometimes I hate it is I get into a call with an account team or with a customer and they're like, the storage team's like, what am I going to do now? The VMware guy can manage all of this. <laughs> and it's not really our goal, but our goal is to allow you to do everything to manage the storage array through the vSphere plugin. If you want so to. that is if you want to. Um, and again, through here, through PowerShell, or through any of those tool sets. But right click a cluster and say configure host. It'll configure the host on the array and all of that. Um, right click it and say create data store. It'll create a volume and map it to your cluster and provision it. You can create and modify all of your data stores and snapshots and things like unmap. But we really take this one step further because if you think about what we've done, um, part of it is being not done yet is with vSphere 8, VMware deprecated the local plugin. So if you're a peer customer today and you might be familiar with having to go to an array and install the plugin from there, that was what we called the local plugin, the 4.x and before. And there's a lot of challenges with that local plugin. So VMware deprecated that with 8.0. And if you look at our new 5.x plugin, that is our new remote plugin. But it also has provided the ability to bring a whole lot of feature sets to the plugin that our customers have been asking for. So role-based access control, remote architecture, the ability to do point in time recovery for both VVOLs and VMFS mm -hmm. um, and kind of providing all of these insights that you just cannot get natively that we're able to pro provide that in there. And there's even more and more stuff coming into it. So we're really excited to kind of bring in, I know there's a lot of conversations around NVMe and or TCP and stuff. And again, it's coming, it's coming. We're not done yet. There's always a whole lot of development. That's Features you want, yep. let us know. So evolves. It's not just been all roses, and uh, sorry. And I appreciate this is where we want to be transparent around some of the challenges we've seen. Uh, back to you. Yeah. So as you kind of mentioned, Andrew, there was really a lot of complexity around the initial setup, and sometimes that that bad taste in your mouth from an initial setup. A lot of the times back in the day, Fossa was a VM you deployed, and you had to do all of these things to get it to run and be stable. At Pure, we kind of always had it as a native service on the array. But challenges, as again, we've seen in the Q&A, are certificate management and failover timing and performance and all of this. And if we think about what are some of those challenges that have kind of stopped adoption, it was a lot of those. And so we kind of reset really in like 21 and 22 is you didn't see a lot of features come out. But what we really did was focused on scale and its performance at scale, stability at scale, and making sure that it truly was ready for that prime time that our customers can come to love and adopt in that case of all of those customers say, I'm running everything. You don't have to, 
but you can. Once we kind of thought about that, we've looked at how has this also matured over time, right? If we look at that 2020 to 2021, kind of 22 mark, there wasn't really a lot of features. But after that, we've been working with Vasa 2.0 with additional features, additional scale, and kind of bringing that on. Because not only is it just us making a really large investment in, in this, it's VMware as well. And Jason Masse is a really good resource at VMware to kind of listen to and see his webinars and around VVols. But again, he's a really big proponent of this. And we're definitely going to see this growing from a VMware perspective, just not pure, but hopefully other storage vendors to make it a better taste in their mouth for all of our customers. When, when we talked about, and I went by it pretty quickly in the previous slide about talking about scale, performance at scale, stability at scale. One of the things that's fascinating that, that often we don't think about, actually, let me go back here one second real fast, is that, um, ah, I think we did a double click, <laughs> is that um, often you think about the data plane and the management plane. So there's the data plane, the data is flowing across, and there's a management plane. VVOLs, usually the data, the actual protocol calls, if it's going in a file system, API interactions versus file system interactions are just a different thing. API interactions are actually sometimes heavier or they weren't built to have the same type of file operations passed across them. So we actually saw things around, you know, managed snapshots that were relatively demanding on the VASA provider. So we had to do a lot of optimizations around almost our management plane. So this was stuff that we saw as pure that we had to embrace and, and we did. That goes to why, you know, we're the number one deployed platform. But this is where, and this is now a little bit of a uh, an industry commentary. If you see people saying, oh, they have checkbox VVOL support and they aren't acknowledging some of this stuff, it may not be as robust and well-engineered under the covers as you might want or hope because we had to un unpiece a lot of these things that VVOLs and VASA provider uniquely and differently stress from a storage array standpoint and solve for it. That's why, you know, like it says, number one deployed platform. Section number well, four. Yeah, I, I yeah, please. Yeah, and one thing is, we'll kind of address this one question live. Is how does the size peer presents to VMware been fixed on either side? And it definitely has. So one of the kind of considerations is when we created a VVOL container um, on an array, we had one per array. And ultimately, um, we can blame Cody for this. I don't know if he's listening, but hey, Cody. <laughs> um, when they said, how big of a storage container should we create? He's like, I don't know, nine petabytes. Um, and it was kind of this running joke because there was no max size, and that was the max size that VMware supported. Um, so that's why it was nine petabytes. Come to find out it wasn't really the max size because SDRS and content libraries can only go two petabytes or lower. Um, so we're kind of changing the default sizes from that. But two things that are kind of coming is one is you could have always contacted peer support to resize that container. It wasn't an end user facing change, but it was possible. But with the latest versions of Purity in 6.4.1, um, we now have the ability to do multiple VVOL containers, uh, which now means that you can carve up multiple containers and not just have one large one. But also what will be coming um, very soon will be, be a, the ability for end user quotas on those containers as well. So you can make it 10 terabytes, five terabytes and maintain it all yourself. So yes, that challenge has definitely gone away, especially for customers who kind of want a tenancy approach in regards to that. So there's more coming, and this is where, for being real, uh, this is a public webinar. We can't have roadmap discussions here. We can with you individually under NDA. You know, what a surprise. Yeah. But wanted to hit on some of the themes that we're looking at. Of course, there's more VVOL engineering today than ever before. But there's, there's kind of three main categories. Do you mind uh, briefly hitting on those, David? Yeah, so number one, stretch storage support. I think that is also the number one question we've had in this mm -hmm. QOA. And thank you to Jason for just putting this really good link in there. So... As we mentioned, it's not necessarily an us thing, it's a joint development, is the reason why we don't have active cluster support for VVOLs is because it's not physically possible today from a VMware perspective. So as part of this joint engineering effort, both Pure and VMware, as well as probably other vendors, are looking at the ability to support stretch storage support. If you are at VMware Explore um, Europe 22, we actually did uh, mm -hmm. a, a live demo, Alex Barber sure. and Jason Masse, um, and we actually did a tech preview of this. So we actually put a link to it. We put a blog, how it works, there's a video and all this great content. So fundamentally it's there. There's still some stuff under the covers that VMware needs to do. Um, again, we can't talk any timelines, but if you want more specifics, consult your VMware reps for any type of VMware specific roadmaps. Or you can also work with us to have these more detailed one-on-ones um, based off that that we can have under NDA. It's always fun having those conversations with all these people, but we have to be careful with what we say there. It is. Performance and scale, more work there, right? And NVMe. There's too. always Last two. There's always there, right? Is you give 
something there you always want more and more and it's for good reason right so performance is always one of those things scales always one of those things right especially from defaults i i have all these dms in there and we're kind of to that point where people aren't really asking for a lot more but we know that we can give more and so a lot of that is really happening when we think about these it's per not just performance of like the IOs, but performance of backups and replication and all of these things. And so it it really kind of ties into a lot of that managed backups and stun times that we've really done a lot of, but it's making that better over time, like we talked about with certificates and other things that are going to be coming. Um, and really the reason why that is important is if you're on any of our arrays in safe mode, scale and objects around, especially around snapshots becomes a challenge. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in flight to kind of help address that. And this scale is just one of those things. And for those with us, thank you for we we are as often happens, we go a little a minute or two past the 45 minute mark. That's cool. There's still a drawing. We haven't forgotten about it in case someone's like, hey, it's 45 minutes. Uh, NVM EOF, man, this is even in purity. 6.4.2. When we first put this slide on, I think it was in a what's next, and it's a what's now, maybe for uh, TCP, Rocky and Fiber Channel around for a while. But uh, anything else you want to add there before we wrap it up? No, I think we can we can jump to the more info because everybody's Ooh. been asking us questions. It's a really great resource <laughs> for for that. So, um, but yeah, if we jump to the the more info, um, Tristan, Jason, awesome. Thank you so much for all of this mm -hmm. um, YouTube channel. What's new? QR code to our platform guide. Everything we talked about is in there. Um, links to documentation, links to VBALS, links to VMFS, our best practices guide, VM analytics, um, all of that as well. Um, still seeing a whole bunch of questions come in. Hopefully, we'll stay. We a little will. bit after and address those offline but the most important thing now is the wonderful drawing so i want to make sure you're here to give props to yourself david cody hoster alex carver nelson elam jason langer kyle Crossmiller, tristan todd if i've left anybody out there's so much great content there and there's a whole team of people more than that behind this it doesn't just happen even as we're, we're the ones up front talking so david we went through a ton of stuff Thank you, like I said, for being in the boat with me and we've been kind of like well, as always like we, we plan it out but not precisely so we are in the home stretch into a drawing and q a so from the drawing i need to make sure to look back here diane k from illinois you are the winner of an ember mug value 130 dollars the kind you can control with your phone please make sure to join us next month where i'll have sandeep on as we'll walk through ai and ml and even some of the application that we're doing is pure but like this even says we're not done yet even here because the goal is that we hang out for another 10 or 15 minutes because man there's been so much great q a and uh, i think jason and uh tristan have been typing their fingers off a little bit which is great <laughs> maybe i will uh, I I'll, pull, I'll pull the music back so up here and uh dive into it david yeah i was gonna kind of take into some of the, the questions so some of these might be easier to update live so um jay pendergraft asked multiple vvols managed by customers can they be multi-sized and dynamically allocated the answer is yes um, multiple containers multiple sizes um from there um as far as dave whitaker's question how many v centers can connect to the same array um ultimately there's no specific limit it's bound by vasta and all of those limits so if, uh, the easiest way to consider this, if you're using the self-signed VASA certificates, you can have one SSO domain connected up. If you want multiple non-linked vCenters to talk to an array, you need to use signed certificates. Um, um, sorry, as far one quick note, I forgot to do the final poll. So I want to toss it in here for <sighs> who is, who is, who is uh, curious about the results. And we'll keep doing Q&A. So let me uh, awesome. share the results there, which is 9% um, don't be a benefit understood you know if you're not using vvols today why not we're not here to push it hard to push it push it on you but because we still do a really good job with vmfs across the board so that's actually an all right answer for pure to be honest uh some a solid quarter is understanding it and then a mix of the rest there uh, hopefully yeah hopefully like this webinar helped customers understand it find out that they're not complex and scary you're not locked in and you and uh, yeah so object limitation still a big consideration but again we're not done yet so we're definitely going to be scaling that up cool back to questions i'll let you keep reading where i can read them to you yeah so, so scalability right always looking at our support site each array model has a different scalability and it's growing with purity so there are certain limits right now at excel support i want to say with the latest purity i think it's five thousand no two thousand vms and i think twenty thousand volumes um so definitely we're going up and those are going to continue to climb um, and then one last one um, from Mr. Luke. Um, shared VVOLs, can they be increased in size while online? 
Um, and I would say not yet. Um, again, it's not an us thing. We're working with VMware. Um, no particular roadmaps or thoughts on that, but yes, that is a challenge, especially when you're using shared disks. Um, even shared VMDKs have that same same issue. So that could have been that 2% that said um, long live RDMs, just for a couple of those quirks <laughs> that you still have to kind of um, consider. So awesome. So status of NVMe over fiber interoperability. Um, that was a big one. So NVMe over fabrics, with Rocky V2 has been around for a while. NVMe over Fabrics with Fiber Channel has also been for a while. NVMe over TCP for VMFS is here today with Purity 642. And NVMe over TCP with VVols will be um, a future conversation as well. If there's things that you want to dive in more specific to those particular timelines and statuses and details, again, we're always more than happy to jump on a call one on one and provide that information. I'm going to pull one out of the answered section just because I was scrolling through that to see if there's anyone that we wanted to highlight. Uh, there was one from Gary um, saying, can you air gap VVols? And man, I can't resist a good air gap ransomware commentary. So, hey, but the, what made me think of was actually a post by Cody Hosterman that I'm putting in the, in the Zoom chat about the case for VVols and ransomware, um, which is actually kind of a funny talk because it's a case for VVols to, to help with ransomware. I'm pretty sure that's what, what Cody yeah. means. So, but it's about the idea that Pure has... Um, call it permissions air gap capabilities. That's safe mode. You know, it's air gap capabilities. And then from a VVOL standpoint, it makes the unit of recovery more granular. So you can actually make a case for that with a pure array, you can do a, a virtual air gap, a permissions air gap, and VVOLs can fit within that because safe mode is an overarching set of capabilities on the array. Um, Gary, if you're curious, I will actually put that in the Q&A back to you. Go read that post that I put in the chat or other ones there because they're there is there is a relationship there, although it's not necessarily one that I one that I lead with necessarily. So, yeah, I and I think a, a big portion of that too is defining air gap and, and dark side. Mm -hmm. So, there is kind of air gap. It's the requirements for VVOLs is that the array needs to talk to your vCenter and talk to your ESXi. It doesn't need access to anything else. So, if your management network is air gapped and those three can communicate together, yes, you can go. But if it is completely air gap where nothing can talk to nothing then there could be potential architecture ways around that. But it, that is that we didn't pull it up of when not to use VVOLs, um, but it's pretty much active plus or active VR and those air gapped or non, um, what is the word? Non um, stable networks where connectivity is there. Because mm -hmm. again, FASA and all of that is really that key. Thing. Yep. And I'm looking through the rest. There's lots of thanks as always. It feels like uh, people enjoyed the session is great you know hey you, you lived up to your billing david thank you um jason or me. tristan is there anyone out anything else and i mean we're we're in kind of relaxed uh let our hair down mode even if you want to come off mute any questions that you want to highlight or comments that you want to put out there on the topic because you know thanks andrew um there's been some really good questions um i mean i've i've got a background in vdi there's been a lot of questions about uh vvol and um support for vdi environments um, things like instant clones and integration with Citrix mm -hmm. provisioning services. I just say that uh, we're working actively this year to kind of refine some of our architectural guidance, uh, nay, best practices around Citrix and VMware Horizon. So I just ask everybody to stay tuned and keep your feedback coming because we're going to build some really uh, good modern VDI content um, and you'll start seeing that this year. Awesome. Thank you, J Tristan. D Jason, I see you off mute too. Yeah, I, nothing here. I was just going to chime into that. I, I was getting ready to respond to the virtual volumes question too. As far as I know, I'll have to double check. I didn't even think instant clones supported virtual volumes unless that's changed recently. So that might be something I, the question came in anonymously. So um, for whoever asked yeah, so that, maybe that might clones, be something you might want to dig into. So Yes. So there's definitely the way to kind of utilize instant clones for that. There's a lot of flexibility around that. So one of the benefits of something we can do is obviously scale when your volume group limit hits, there's some benefits. So if we think about um, the way we kind of do it for containers, um, we utilize the concept of a first class disc. Think about a first class disc as an independent VVOL. Um, we didn't really go in, down into the details of VVOLs, but when we move a VM to a VVOL, we create a configuration VVOL um, we create a disk for the OS, a disk for the data, and then one for the swap file. And when you use like a, a first class disk, it's kind of its own independent container, which means that no matter how many first class disks you create, it shares a configuration. 
And so that's kind of that use case where you might have, say, a database that you want to be able to clone multiple times. It's not attached to an instance, but it's just a volume that you want to go to. Something like that can be looking at how we can tie those into the instant clone functionality to kind of get around those object limits. But again, we're working on those. So again, 2000 VMs, I think is today the limit. So 2000 volume groups on the array. If you're doing anything more than that, we'd love to hear from you to see what are your requirements to see what we can do for those particular use cases. I think we are at the end of the questions. There was, there was so much we were going through, David. I sometimes play the game at the end of like, man, I wish I'd said that earlier, but we were off to the races. Uh, anything else you want to highlight before we, uh, before we bring it home and close up for the month? Um, I don't know. This was really um, exciting to do. And again, we're always here. Um, we're active on social media. Find any of us. Tag us on Pure. Um, we have code.purestorage.com where yes. we have links to a lot of our automation resources. Um, there's also a Slack. Um, you don't have to post questions specifically around automation and code. We have channels around vSphere plugin and vEvolves and all of that. It's a really great way to interface directly with customers, partners, employees, engineers, and really just communicate with us in, in that standard medium. So always a so good thing. So glad you do. mentioned code.peerstorage.com. Um, go check out all the great things there. That's what you can have when you have an API first platform that's simplified under the covers and then you care about automation. All that stuff is what comes out of it. That please awesome. make sure to... Uh, uh, actually, one last note from Matt uh, about how do we get on the Slack. You go to code.purestorage.com. I want to say it's in the top right. If I can see it in my head right, it's it's right it's right there at the link. So, yeah, we're just searching for pure storage code Slack. <laughs> there you go. Multiple ways, not too hard. Thank you all so much again for joining us. Please make sure to join us next month uh, for a session with Sandeep, walking through AI and ML and how we're turning buzzwords into reality and both you know both general background of what he's seen with this being real in the industry. And then even what we're doing specifically here at Pure. With that, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Tristan, Jason, Lauren, and to all of you for attending the end of this month's coffee break. Please join us next month. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. <laughs>